Wait for it. Oh, now we're live. Guys. We are officially live. Hi, Katie. Hi. I was like, Jackson? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's weird even for me. Uh, the, the Jackson Rob thing is a little bit strange. <laughs> I know. That's all right. We'll address it and then we'll move on. We will. Um, we should introduce each other. We should. Let me, uh, let me, let me jump in. Let me, let me introduce you because you have, you have the more fabulous hair. So you get to go first. Well, I get to introduce you first. <laughs> go. Okay. All right. So you are looking at the fabulous and wonderful KB Wages. Uh, they are the author of the Indranan and Farian War trilogies with Orbit and the new and rather brilliant Neo G adventures with Harper Voyager. They grew up on a farm on the eastern plains of Colorado, and despite moving a whole lot in their 20s, didn't end up all that farm from where they started. Far from where they started, excuse me. And their most recent tattoo, which they showed me before all this, is of the planet Pluto, and it's fucking amazing. That's me. Hey, everybody. Oh, yeah, um, hey, people in the chat, what's happening? I know. It's going to be one of those, like, I keep looking this direction to look at chat, so <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Um, hey, sitting on whichever side of the screen you can see um, with me is Jackson Ford, who is the author of The Girl Who Could Move Shit With Her Mind. You know, I didn't even ask if I could actually cuss on this, but it's too late now. Sorry. Andrew. Yes, you can fucking cuss. This uh, is a, this is cuss central. This is an adult show. Yeah, straight up. Um, and <laughs> Random Shit Flying Through the Air, which is out today. Happy book birthday. Thank you so much. Um, he claims to have bad hair. I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with that. Also, a crap South African accent, again, which I don't agree with. He does, however, have a lot of pretty good tattoos himself. And as you can see, I'm something of a connoisseur on those. Um, he sometimes writes under his real name, Rob Bufford. So if you hear me call him Rob, it's not because I'm violating his witness protection. Um, it's because <laughs> that's how I met him. <laughs> and it's hard to get past that. Um, those books are the Outer Earth series, which uh, is a pretty banging set of books, um, uh, which were sold to me under the guise of space parkour. And I said, done. Um, also a book called Adrift, uh, which is a pretty awesome um, Gilligan's Island in space complete with mysteries. And yeah, so here we are. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Um, oh, and we already blew it. That's fine. Um, how, just how, did to, we, how did we already blew it? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, just to remind everybody, there is a button down on the bottom of your screen to ask questions if you want to throw questions down in there rather in the chat so that we don't get lost and lose your questions. Um, there is also a talk about green button on the screen that will yeah. open you to a new window. It says, yeah, what is it? It says buy Jackson and Katie's books, which is, I think that's the greatest button in history. I think we can both agree. Yeah, I am I am in full <laughs> like approval of that. Uh, mm. So. And in addition, the this whole um, live event, this whole event is being recorded, and you can rewatch it after the event is over. Uh, Katie and I will share it uh, far and wide. So if you have to duck out for any reason, don't worry; you'll be able to catch the rest of it later. Yeah, yeah. And we already have a bunch of really cool questions to start us off. We do. You want to go first? Yeah. It looks like your name's at the top. Uh yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh God, this. Uh, right. Um, Okay, so this comes from Anju. Uh, so thank you, Anju, for asking this. How do you feel about your book series being adapted into a TV series? And KB, if you had a choice of a type of adaptation for your series, what would you like to see it as? TV show, movie, animated, graphic novel, etc., and why? And I get to I get to blow your mind, Anju, because um, the the Andronan War trilogy it is the Andronan War trilogy, right? The first one. Yes. Yes, has already been adapted for TV. So both of ours, both of our books, have been adapted for TV. No, which is pretty yeah. awesome. Um, yes. So mine has been uh, kind of in the works for a little while. I think your deal's a little bit newer, right? Mm, yeah. um, but mine, we're kind of in uh, COVID holding pattern at the moment. Yep. Ah, it's so much fun. Um, we are, we have been working on uh, 
a TV show for uh, Behind the Throne. Um, and it's it kind of in development stages, which as everybody knows in Hollywood speak means that there's a lot of stuff going on and there's a lot of waiting going on. So um, yeah, at the moment, that's kind of where we're sitting. We have a pretty nice um, uh, like outline-ish thing that's being discussed. And I think that's about all I can say about it without getting in trouble, so. <laughs> how, how did it feel when it first got adapted? Um, it is a, a rather strange, uh, thing, you know, you just, I was in the middle of, um, like pretty crunchy deadline stuff when it came in. So I got an email from my agent and was like, this is great. And then went back to work. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna tell us a little bit about yours. Yours is kind of, like I said, a little bit newer. Yes. Well, you say that, but th this we, this initially got put in motion um, around this time last year. There was this kind of two week flurry of activity where because I have I fortunately I have very very good agents know a lot more than I do, and they managed to line up I think about four different studios to who, who were who were vying for the option, and so I had a two week period where I was kind of just taking multiple calls from these various people, and it. it it felt very strange and weird to be like the center of attention all at once and to be the one people were chasing after. It felt very bizarre. I've not had that situation many times. Um, and then after we made the decision um, to go with CBS and Secret Hideouts, um, who are a fantastic production outfit who just did Star Trek Discovery, after we made that decision, there was about nine months of almost total silence while CBS's lawyers and our film agents hammered out the contract. Um, and I understand why it took so long, because the end contract ended up being 57 pages long and just ridiculously dense. But it was a very strange process. I was super excited, but I couldn't tell anybody about it because I hadn't signed the damn contract yet. But right. when I got it done, when you finally put ink on paper or digital ink on paper, uh, then we, we then I cracked open the whiskey. Um, I've noticed that in the in the chat, Ben has asked, Rob, are we going to see you on the big screen cameo? And my answer is, yeah, I'm, I'm playing Tegan. I'm playing the lead character, obviously. Um, you know, I, the part's made for me because I made the part of Tegan. Um, no, but the, I do want to, like, be murder victim number seven or something. Katie, I'm sure you also want to, you want a cameo if, I, if, I, if, if your series ever gets made, right? You know, to be brutally honest, not really. What? <laughs> what? I'm revoking your writing card. Get out. I'm a writer for a reason, Rob. I don't, like, <laughs> this is about the extent of, you know, being on screen that I like to deal with. I would like to be able to go and watch and, you know, hang out while they're <laughs> doing all the stuff that they're professionally trained to do <laughs> versus me who is not. Um, I just, you know what, I like you say that and I already have nightmares about the idea of like going and screwing something up really badly or, yeah. Well, Don, Don in the chat so, says, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not an actor. Basically, <laughs> I'm not even a doctor, I'm just a writer. <laughs> I could play the part of somebody who's a bad actor, Ben, that would be. <laughs> so you're like acting the part of a bad actor. Actorception. Right? Could you do that? I don't know. We could, actually. I suppose there is a couple of scenes where you could probably <laughs> throw something in. Yeah. In, anyway, so that so you, you've got a couple of questions in the in the question list as well. So why don't you hit one? All right. Let me find. Let me find one. Where are we? Please hold. I've got them up if you need me to read you one. No, I got it. I got it. All right. I got this under control. Um, well, let's pull. Uh, let's pull Amy's question. Amy asked us: um, the Indranan Empire is steeped in Indian traditions, customs, and religion. Uh, what inspired you about Indian culture to help you create the matriarchal empire? <clears throat> I want to hear the answer to this too, actually. Right. So. Um, one of the biggest catalysts for setting the Andronan War in a sort of far-flung um, Indian diaspora was the an article that I read um, way back when I started writing the book um, about the Indian space program um, and the fact that they had, if I recall correctly, just shot off a rock, like successful rocket test. Um, 
and it was one of those things where, you know, you, you kind of get tired of reading the same old books about the same old people. Um, and it occurred to me, you know, there are a, a whole lot of people across the world who are not white or American. Um, and the idea that we would send people into space who are only white and American struck me as more than a little unrealistic. Hmm. So um, I, I basically started researching and looking um, at the Indian Space Agency and a lot of the work that they had been doing. And then from there just started to evolve this, um, uh, the idea of a bunch of colony ships that would have left Earth looking for some place to live. And that the bulk of them would have been from Southeast Asia and from Asia, um, because with the number of people that are over there, you would, you know, you would think that the percentages would be quite a bit higher. So, hmm. yeah. I seem to remember you telling a particular story about there was a particular ornament on a Christmas tree, and it stuck in your brain. Do I have that right? You do. Um, that's. I'm like, it's not behind me. I thought it was on the wall behind me, but it's not. Um, that's how the whole book started. Uh, there is a, um, a tatted ornament. And for those who don't know, tatting is a like a form of crocheting, but you do it with very, very fine thread um, and a shuttle. And then you, but like crocheting, you basically tie a lot of knots. So uh, my grandmother and her like mother used to do a lot of tatting and my mother picked it up. Um, and I have a number of Christmas ornaments, um, one of which is a diamond shape. Um, and the Christmas that I came up with the idea, I was laying on the couch um, and happened to see the ornament, you know, swinging on the Christmas tree. Um, and then just boom, basically the first 10 pages of uh the uh, behind the throne kind of popped into my head in this gigantic uh <laughs> wash of screen you know live on screen color um, I love it when that happens right and i you know and only one thing got changed in that uh entire 10 pages the whole time we were you know the i wrote a really awful <laughs> first draft and got rejected and um completely revised the story um, and changed a lot of stuff, but only one thing in those first 10 pages. So, yeah. Had you written anything before that or was that the first one? Oh Lord, that was not the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote, uh, I think something like 12 or 13 books before that. Wow. So yeah, I, I took what's known as the long, slow, torturous road to publication. Um, I'd actually been trying to get published since like 99, I think, which is when I wrote my first book, um, which was a truly awful um, science fiction story about aliens involving the earth, or invading the earth and time travel. And so, oh man, it was not, it was not good. It's a chunk novel for a reason. Um, yeah. So yeah, I wrote a lot of stuff before that, but that was, I, I'd shopped out um, a space opera that was, what I like to call Battlestar Galactica meets Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy right before Behind the Throne. And it was about 10 years early, too early for the space okay. opera revolution. So <laughs> we moved on to the next project. <laughs> okay. Well, it clearly worked out well for you because now Neo G is number seven, six, seven. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna count. What do we have there? There's five six it was it's it was technically like number six i think okay and then yeah and then there's i've got two more which would make eight total so that that tracks yeah okay right in other words you and i are both stuck in this life forever pretty much yeah <laughs> you y'all are y'all are stuck with us so. <laughs> but what I, like tell me what what came up because i Full confession, have not yet read The Girl Who Could Move Shit with Her Mom. What? Get out. <laughs> Leave now. Go read it now. How dare you? <laughs> you know what my schedule is. That's true. Yeah. So where did it come from? Okay. Well, that actually um, 
ties in quite nicely with the question that is that has been asked in the on the last question panel, which is from Mustafa. He says, "As an LA native, I appreciated how you conveyed a deep sense of the city. What drew you to Los Angeles, and how did you get to know the place so well?" Um, so, to come at it, um, Katie, from your question is essentially, I, I wanted to write a book that had a superhero who was not a typical superhero. Um, I love superheroes and I love Marvel and I love DC, but I didn't want to do something that had been done before. And so I knew that it was useless trying to come up with an original superpower. Um, they don't exist. They've all been done. They're like sex positions. They've been done a million times over and there are photographs to prove it. Um, so I, I kind of looked at it like, how can I make this different? The way I did was, well, I can have the character be a total jackass. Um, and, if, and so once I developed what this character was, Tegan Frost, the, the girl who could move ship with her mind and she wants to be a chef, but she can't, and she's a, she's just a total wanker about things, then I needed a setting. Um, and I, work, I was having discussions with, with Orbit, um, and Orbit published both um, Katie and myself, um, if you don't know. So I was having discussions with um, our, our my editor there. And we were talking about where we want to sit, and they said, you should set it somewhere that's kind of a not as small as a town, but not as big as a city. And my first thought was, well, I'll put it in Vancouver then, which is where I live. And they went, yeah, but Vancouver's boring. And I went, yes, yes, it is boring. I will go and have another think. Um, and eventually I looked at it and went, what is a city that has not had enough stories set in it, that has a lot of depth to explore, that I've spent a lot of time in and that I deeply love? Los Angeles. Um, when I was about... About sort of eight years ago, when I was still a working journalist, I won something called the Getty Fellowship, um, which is where they bring a group of 10 arts journalists um, to LA. Uh, the Getty Foundation does this. And they essentially put you up in a hotel and spend 10 days taking you around Los Angeles, showing you the parts of the city that don't get seen by tourists. They take you to monuments and art galleries and sculptures. They take you out to the Watts Towers. They give you a sense of the, the LGBTQ theater scene. They do all these amazing things. And so I fell in love with kind of the, the, the culture side of Los Angeles that's outside of the film industry and, and the music industry. And so I looked at this and went, I want to write a story that sits right there. Um, and it's worked out really well because what the books have let me do is, is, is essentially take the reader to those places and then have massive action scenes in them with lots of things getting blown up, which of course, as we know, is the most fun thing to do. But like in random shit, flying through the air, there's a big scene set at the Watts Towers, which is this incredible sculpture out in, out in Watts, just south of Compton, um, that nobody ever goes to, um, because it's in a, it's in a slightly dodgy area and it's just mind blowing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just, I love Los Angeles. You can hear it when I'm talking about it. And it was a lot of fun to actually set a story there. That's awesome. Yeah. I have been to Los Angeles, I think twice. And what did you think? Oh, I, I liked it quite a bit. I mean, it's a big city. I'm not a huge fan of big cities, but, um, you know, as big cities go, it's, it's nice. And I do like California quite a bit. I would move there if it weren't for the earthquakes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, that's also, funnily enough, something that gets dealt with in, uh, in that book. Um, there are a couple of massive earthquakes. If you don't like taking risks, don't move to California. <laughs> <laughs> Although, as also Drew says in the chat, Vancouver is not boring. It's nice, which may be worse. Definitely. 100% confirmed. Wonderful place to live. Terrible place to set a book. Oh, all right. We, we got more questions. Katie, no. you can let's do, um, let's do Christy's question about, have you seen your writing and editing patterns change since entering COVID slash sheltering times? Oof, that's a good I one. Know. Okay. Isn't that a, <laughs> cause I'm sure everybody wants to hear about that right now. <laughs> so. <laughs> all right. You first. Oh, me first. Um, you know, my, my my day life hasn't changed all that much. Um, my day job did not like go into quarantine or lockdown or anything of that type because I work in the manufacturing sector. Um, and so we, rather than seeing like the same kind of slowdowns or people working from home type of thing, we like just exploded and started running stuff um, a lot more 
than we had been. Um, we uh, It's a relatively small shop, so we were pretty good as far as social distancing um, and that sort of thing. So I, I continue to go to work. I still go to work four days a week. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in that my schedule is such that I have Fridays off anyway, so I can um, do that. But, and I was um, just wrapping up uh, I had finished um, Out Past the Stars in December, um, and I finished edits on it in April. And I finished writing the next Neo G book for Harper Voyager, um, which is called Hold Fast Through the Fire. Uh, Ooh, title. I knew I was pretty happy with that title. Um, <laughs> It's very navy, <laughs> which, very. which which maybe for the NeoG is not a good thing, but that's fine. We'll roll with it. Um, in March, I turned in that one, and I'm I'm waiting on edits for that. So I kind of had an, a nice break, which is really lucky for me because oh boy, was I like I mean I've written eight books in four years, um, or seven books in four years since Behind the Throne was technically done before we started this whole situation. <laughs> so, you know, my, um, my like writing and editing patterns haven't changed a whole lot simply because I was like right on the verge of burnout. And the minute I was done with all my stuff, I was done. And I've spent the last like three months kind of going to my day job and then coming home and laying on the couch and playing a lot of PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> or sleeping Small. a whole lot, which is awesome. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's not COVID, by the way. That was just um, crunchy throat. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I've I've worked from home for the past Jesus over a decade now because I was a freelance journalist long before I was an author. Um, so you know, stay at home and don't leave. Okay, that's my day to day life. Um, so you know, in terms of the, the actual day-to-day, -day, what I'm doing, that hasn't changed very much. What has changed is that it all feels a bit weird. It is slightly strange to be writing a book, a piece of fiction, a piece of entertainment, at a time when you can objectively look outside and go, there are things that are so much more important right now, and holy shit, what are we doing about this? It feels slightly frivolous. And I had to kind of sit myself down and give myself a bit of a talking to and go, look, entertainment is not frivolous. What you do is not frivolous. It's important to you and it's important to your readers. So get on with it, Ford. Come on. Right. Um, yeah. And I've got several messages from people thanking me for, you know, providing them with something to kind of take their minds off of this whole situation. And yeah, so... Yeah, Mel has just said in the chat, fiction is one of the things getting me through this time. So yeah, it's... But certainly it's it's taken a bit of mental readjustments. I mean, I'm relatively lucky in BC. Our COVID numbers have been low. We have approached it quite well. So we're fine. But obviously, like, I'm, I'm worried about people in the States like yourself, Katie, and, and all my friends down there and in the UK and in South Africa. So there's that fear that you've got to tamp down on a daily basis. So the work itself has not changed. The mental aura around the work has taken a bit of getting used to. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And we are, yeah, I, Colorado has been relatively lucky thus far, um, you know, but it's, it's hard not to be worried about everybody. And I think that's probably one of the things that's like pattern wise is just like you said, everything is very weird. You know, I haven't seen, I haven't seen my family in three months or almost four. I like literally the last time I saw uh, friends and family was the book launch for A Pale Light in the Black, the beginning mm. of March. And it was like the very last public outing that we did besides me going to work and going early, early morning to the grocery store so that I can avoid people whenever possible. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I got a little bit lucky. I went back to South Africa for a couple of weeks in February um, to see my family. And I got back in just before the door slammed. Um Ooh which 
I mean, if I'd been on the other side of the world, away from my my wife and my dog, when the door slammed, that would have been a bit of a disaster. But yeah, let's move let's move on to something a little happier. I think this this COVID right. stuff is yeah. Sorry, <laughs> that, that got a bit fucking dark. Sorry, there. guys. We got it out of the way. There, now yeah. we're done. Let's talk about something. Fun. All right, all right. I'll pick one. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, oh, um, Essa Hansen has asked a question. Essa, if you guys don't know, is another Orbit author. Uh, she's written a book called No Fat Gloss which I've read and it's fucking fantastic. Uh, she's also kind of my superhero in that she is a sound designer at Skywalker Sound. Hello, boy. Sorry, my dog's just coming. This is Tundra, by the way. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> you said he was going to come in and like... <laughs> Look at that. He's like, oh, did. dad's on the phone. Um, okay, so yeah, she's a sound designer at Skywalker Sound. She's fantastic. And her question is, what are your tactics for dealing with deadlines and crutch? So, Katie, you, how about you go first? Hey, <laughs> um, a lot of panic and a lot of tears. No, <laughs> shower, drinking in the shower. That's the, that's the tactic. Um, you know, I got your I, tactics right here. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, I, I picked a hell of a decade to stop drinking. I'll tell you that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I keep trying and it just doesn't <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, the I, I don't know. You know, I, I feel so often like my deadlines and my schedule have just been this weird outlier that it's it's sometimes so difficult to talk about. Um, I mean, like I like I mentioned earlier, I wrote I've written seven books in four years, essentially. Um, and so my deadlines were like, like one right on top of the other. Yeah. Um, and it's. Like my tactics essentially are, are kind of the same way I tackle about everything else in my life, which is just buckle down and do it. Um, I generally aim when I'm on deadline and I have a book due, I figure out like, you know, X number of words um, that I need on such and such a date. And then I, I do the math backwards to figure out how many words a day I need. Um, and then I, I usually shoot for a weekly total just so that it's slightly less stressful because you don't always um, come up with, you know, 500 words a day or whatever. But sometimes you can, you know, you manage to get, you know, 3,000 on a weekend or whatever. So, yeah, that's – I. <laughs> I, I tend to buckle down and stop seeing my friends and my family and just like lock myself in my office and write for a couple of hours every night after I get home from work. And um, that's, I wouldn't advise it, I guess I would say straight up. Like I, I, <laughs> I, I mentioned earlier, like I really, I am kind of recovering from burnout and it's not a great place to be. Um, like mentally or physically, <laughs> it takes kind of a takes kind of a toll on you. Um, and uh, so, yeah, like the, but those are sort of my major things. And we're I'm in a holding pattern right now. I'm I'm done. I need to start pitching some ideas. So that's kind of I'm letting the old brain relax a little bit. And we've it started rolling some ideas around, and stuff has started um, screaming in the background that wants to be, you know, written about. So that's where I'm going with it. You know what you reminded me of there a little bit? Have you ever read um, The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe? You know, it's been a long time since I have, but yeah. yeah. But it, it was like the, um, so how the old astronauts used to do, the night before a space mission, they'd go out and go racing in their Corvettes and, and get fucked up and just get completely drunk. And the old thing was, I don't advise it, you understand, but it can be done. <laughs> That's where you remind me of a little bit. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. Like, you're about to strap a rocket to your ass and shoot yourself yeah. into space. So you may as well. Like, <laughs> <laughs> True, true story. <laughs> yeah, from from my perspective, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I, I have a, you know, a decade plus of being a journalist and dealing with weekly, sometimes daily deadlines where it was a case of if you don't put um, words on the paper and, get it into the editor, you don't get paid and you don't eat. So that's a motivator. So when it comes to kind of to book deadlines, I've been, you know, usually I, I kind of managed to come in a little bit ahead of deadline. 
a few days where I've, where I kind of finish up and I go, okay, my deadlines in a couple of days. I haven't had a situation yet where it's like the night before my book is due. And I'm like, fuck, I have a quarter of this book to write. And I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm sure that'll happen at some point with one of my books, but up until this point, things have been pretty slow and steady. Nothing along your lines of productivity, Katie, which I'm frankly in fucking awe about. Um, I don't know how you do it, but yeah. So I, 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 I kind of just plod slowly towards the finish and have a daily word count. And as long as I meet that, I know I'm going to have a book at the end. It might be a pile of shit, but it will be a finished book. It's almost guaranteed to be that. Like, yeah, ideally I would, I would like the time to like polish that up a little bit before I dump it in my editor's lap. But so far they've been pretty, uh, pretty okay with me being like here. <laughs> it's, it's done. I don't know how good it is. You oh know, my god! I just I just got the edit notes back for the um the the, the next book in the series, um, which is called Eye of the Shitstorm. It's out next year. Um, and after I'd sent in the manuscript to to Anna at Orbit, um, Anna Jackson, who was my editor, I, I was kind of flicking, reading it back, flicking through it, and I was going, "Oh my god, this is the dirtiest, least clean manuscript I've ever sent in. There are errors, fucking everywhere. She is going to turn this down." She was very nice about it. Do you, you so do you look at your stuff after you, after you turn it in? I'm I'm stealing a question of my own because I can. Um like I I turn my I turn my manuscript in and then I walk away from it. Like I don't look at it until I get edits back. I look at it if I have a particular idea or if I want to check something to see if I can do something and edit. So I'll go, okay. It'll still be on my mind because obviously I'm thinking about what has to be changed. I'm going, well, okay, what if I could do this instead? But can I do that? I need to check the manuscripts. I need to read back and see what I did then. So I don't check it necessarily from an urge of, I must reread what I wrote in case it's total shit and I must confirm this to myself. It's more a case of let me reread it and see what I did. Because often I don't remember what I did in the first like 10 chapters. They're just, they're gone from my memory. I don't know what happened there. (laughs) They they just dump themselves like. (laughs) Yeah. Oh. Although I, I definitely, I definitely can't look at the book for like two weeks after I submit it. I can't even think about it. I'm just too wiped. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's often, I mean, and for me, a lot of times, like I had to jump right into the next book. So it was like, you know, you get two weeks off to like read something else, panic, read a bunch of books and do some other stuff. Cause I can't generally read fiction while I'm trying to write. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I just, it's too... I am extremely susceptible to other people's worlds in my head. And so I have to be very careful about the media that I consume while I am trying to create and be that television or um, books or movies or like I've lucked out with some of the like big blockbuster movies that came out that I really wanted to see happen to mm. fall in that like oh, space. Oh, right. <laughs> so I could actually go see them. Otherwise, you know, some stuff like I, I have a couple of what? Well, oh, I just finished watching She-Ra the other day because I I couldn't watch it while I was trying to write, um, and then it took me a little while to like talk myself back into seeing it once I had the space. So, yeah, my wife my wife has watched She-Ra, and I caught little bits here and there, and I keep thinking I should really go watch that. It looks 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 pretty good. You should. It was a delight, and they handle <laughs> a lot of stuff really well. So cool. yeah. I, I had I was a little iffy about it there for a while, but I quite enjoyed it by the time we nice. got to the end. So we wow, we're into the we're into the second half of this crowd cast. So yeah, let's let's do some more questions. We've got a bunch yeah. to get through. All right. All right, choose um, one. Well, we're we're at the top here. Um this is seems to be more of a topic suggestion. Um so if anybody has specific questions to this topic, I'm going to say now, go ahead and throw them into chat so that we're not just rambling for half an hour about non-binary characters and non-romantic strong relationships, which is something that we talked about on Twitter the other day. Well, by we, I mean Twitter, not me and Ford. Uh <laughs> Because I don't think you were involved in that conversation. <laughs> I don't believe I was. No, I'm not sure I had a huge amount to contribute to it beyond yay non-binary. Yeah. Well, and we were there was a discussion on Twitter about um, like platonic relationships and and f- the idea that friendships don't necessarily need to evolve into romantic relationships, despite what a lot of media has told us over the years that mm. anybody who has a very very strong friendship 
it needs to end up in bed together. Um, and so, yeah, so we had some, we had some really fascinating discussions about that. We were talking about like more specifically on my end, the, um, fact that I did not very deliberately did not put Hale into a relationship in the Andronan war, um, series because a she had just recovered like her boyfriend slash love of her life had been killed like two seconds before the book starts um and we felt like that was maybe a little crass to throw her into a new relationship um and and then b she was like trying not to die the whole time which i feel like sometimes can put a damper on you know developing a new a new relationship of the romantic variety. So mm-hmm. I, you know, the real focus obviously in the Andron and War series is the friendships and the 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 really, really strong non-romantic relationships that exist between her and Emery and Zinn um, and some of the other people that she meets. So um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a deliberate choice on my part and it was, um, I'm, it was one of those things where there was like some editorial pushback about like, Hale needs a partner. She needs somebody to be like her Zin to her Emery yeah. <laughs> type of thing. And I was like, no. Yay, Emery and Zin. <laughs> Yay for Emery and Zin. Um, and, and in reality, like as the series progresses, like her her mentor, How does fill some of that. Um, but again, like they're not involved with each other. Um and have never been involved with each other outside of a like super awkward kiss that I have talked about at a couple of points. Um, but it just, it didn't seem necessary um, in this particular iteration, which isn't to say that romance and romance novels aren't necessary because I think that they are. And I do love me a good romance. Um, it just, it's not always the way you have to go with it. So. I'd agree with that. And, you know, I've, I've noticed that in, in the chat, um, Cynthia, Brandon, and Essa are, are talking along the lines of, you know, friendships are, are actually um, worth focusing on sometimes more than the romance. And that's something that I don't think I appreciated until recently. When I kind of looked at the books I was reading and looked at the relationships that I enjoyed and went, you know what, it wasn't, it's not the romantic ones that I really, really like. It's the deep, complicated friendships. Sorry, excuse me. There's a phone going off somewhere in my house. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 this idea that you don't have to always have your character be involved in a romantic relationship, or if you if you do, it doesn't have to be central to the story. And I realize this isn't um, necessarily addressing the question about non-binary characters, but in terms of non-romantic strong relationships, that's something that I'd like to explore a bit more. And I, I can't talk about the details because it's it's to do with a one a current book I'm writing, but the question of whether to have a romantic relationship or a particular friendship is something that I'm knocking around at the moment. So this is actually quite a timely question, certainly from my end. Yeah, yeah. So we had someone on to 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 move on real quick. We had someone on Twitter ask us about a thousand questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab I'm gonna grab one of his. Um, because uh, I, I feel like someone who asked that many questions should at least get some of them answered. <laughs> His name is at Sparky Gremlin. He is he him. And uh, he has asked, uh, do you and KB Wages like comic books or graphic novels? And if so, which ones and why? Well, and it looks Different. like it looks like Brandon in the chat would be. Oh, we have a uh, name. Is that you, Brandon? Would, would be our, our culprit there for all the questions, which we ah, do appreciate. Finally, we get a name, Sparky Gremlin. I like Sparky Gremlin. I'm going to keep calling you Sparky Gremlin. That's cool. <laughs> just, you're like, you're just going to stick with him. Um, Go for it. I have not read many uh, graphic novels and or comic books. Um, I have... I, kind of the opposite problem. I think a lot of people who, who read comic books, um, like who really enjoy reading comic books, the the pictures are entirely too distracting for me to focus on the story. So I, I can't like, it's too hard for me to scan and read, um, across a page of comics with all of the stuff that's going on. Um, so yeah, so I, I don't, I don't read, um, 
I don't read much and I'm trying to think like kind of even the last like I have picked up some on occasion um my roommate for quite a long time was a huge is a huge comic book fan um and uh she's actually the one who kind of introduced me to a lot of the comic book stuff um before even like the marvel movies and and whatnot came out um i am a big fan of the mcu uh you know and i really enjoyed a lot of the stuff that they that they did there um but yeah like as far as stuff that i have read um there's been kind of a scattering. I've picked up some like individual titles. I always enjoy, especially like at, at Denver um, uh, Pop Culture Con. Boy, I always have to stop and think now about what that damn thing's called. <laughs> um, there's Denver Pop Culture <laughs> Con. I mean, come on, really? Come on, San Diego. Thanks for yeah. ruining it for everybody. We had a nice, easy <laughs> format overall. Yeah. Now we're all confused. Um, there is always a really good indigenous press that does a lot, like puts out a lot of comics. Um, yeah. And I wish I could remember the name. I'll have to, if you're following me on Twitter, I will, I will try and find it and post it on Twitter. Um, but I've picked up several from them over the years that I have looked at. Um, and then like, I think one of the ones that I, that really sticks out enough for me to remember is the comic book that they did for Pacific Rim. Um, that was called, I think, Year Zero or something about mm. the like initial kaiju attack, if I recall correctly, is what it was about. So mm. yeah, that was pretty cool. But otherwise, no, I'm not a huge. <laughs> that was a really. I took a really long time to say that I don't read <laughs> comics. Sorry. <laughs> I read some comics. I'm kind of with you in that that I'm not a big comic book reader. Um, I think what turns me off a lot of them, and especially the more traditional series, that you know your your X Men comic books, for example, are that I I can't just dive in and know what's going on because I dive in and I go right, okay, Cyclops died, but he came back again, and then he was cloned, and then there was a whole time travel thing, and now Earth isn't Earth; it's a giant potato, and I just I I can't do it. But if you're talking about like more self-contained stories, like um, Saga or Why the Last Man or um, The Sculptor was a was a really fucking good comic book. Um, those I am all in for, 100%. But I tend to be really, really picky and choosy about which comic books I read. I'm definitely not a traditional comic book reader. Not a chance. Yeah. And I do, like, the gra I appreciate, deeply appreciate a lot of the art that goes into that. Yes, um, 100%. And some of them are, are so beautiful and have such a, a really lovely... Um, like storyline. And that's, well, I guess that I would give a shout out to two others that I have read. One is Pretty Deadly. Um, and then the other one is Bitch Planet, which is <laughs> quite a lot of I fun. I don't know what that um, is, but I want to read it just on principle. Oh my Bitch God, you Planet. know it. It is so great. What, it's, what is it's, Bitch Planet? It is basically a story about, so Bitch Planet is a like penal colony planet where they send all the women who act out. Um, and yeah, they all get like branded with, uh, with an NC, um, which is stands for non-compliant. Um, okay. and then, and the, the comics are about like this woman who gets sent to the prison colony and then <clears throat> all the shit that happens after. So, yeah. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Check that out. Yeah. I really recommend. I and don't read I... comics, but here's this amazing comic book I read. You should check it out. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is how my brain works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gra grab us another question. Grab us another question. All right. We'll just, we're, we're at the top here. Uh, from Ben, what percentage of the time do you A, love, or B, put up with, and C, hate writing? <laughs> Boy, how much time you got, Ben? <laughs> we only have 16 minutes left. Oh, shit. I need 16 hours for this fucking question. Man, okay, so hang on. How, how was it? What percentage of the time do you love, put up with, or hate? I'm kind of all three at once. No, we need like, There's like D, all of the above options. Yeah, all of the above, all the time. I, I, I love writing passionately. It's what I live to do every day. At the same time, I sit down and stare at the screen and look at where I've got to in the book and think, I can't be fucking asked to do this. I'm going to Twitter. I've had enough with this. And then the rest of the time, I'm just like, 
I'm writing, I'm writing. Yes, it's fine, it's fine. It'll do, I suppose. I'll fix it later. And at the same time, I'm going, this is amazing, and I'm the greatest author in the world. I mean, it's all of them at the same time, 100% of the time for all of them. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I uh, here's the thing that I hate about writing. Like really truly hate because there's not there's not much that I hate about writing. Even with deadlines and edits and copy edits and past pages and all the all the kind of besides behind the scenes work that go into making a book um that that are technically writing but not really the creative endeavor of writing. Um, the, the thing that I really hate about writing is when I have an idea in my head and I cannot get it onto the page in the way that, you know, translates and, and you're like <laughs> flailing and nodding and it, yep. it's like, I think every writer that I know understands the kind of pain that comes from like yeah, the, the number of times that I have said, can I just plug something in here and download it onto the page because I can't. I can't get the words on the page to match what I am seeing in my head. Um, and that is that is something that I truly hate. But then something that I love really is that like moment when you figure out what's going on in the book and what is, you know, what is about to happen or, or you come across a scene that is just so brilliant, so like moving, mm. uh, all of those little pieces that kind of bring up that really pure joy of writing is is yeah something that i really love about you you you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there so for because for, for me like a book when it comes to me is a whole series of interconnected images particular scenes i want to happen particular interactions and the hard parts for me are the connecting bits between those images but when one of those connecting bits breaks out and as I'm writing, it becomes something completely different and weird and wild and awesome that I hadn't anticipated. That's where the love comes in. That's where I go, this is what I'm meant to be doing. This is what I'm meant to be doing with my life, my life right here. Whether I flame out spectacularly or hit the New York Times bestseller list, I don't care. This is what I do it for. Yeah. And then five minutes later, I'm like, this is shit. I hate everything. Fuck it. Why? Why am I doing this? Who's Why Brad? Am I doing, doing this? <laughs> Yeah, it certainly is like that, <laughs> that back and forth. But yeah, I've, I've said multiple times. I mean, obviously, I I wrote 12 flipping books before I even got published. And I would continue to write another 12 more, even if I never get another contract. Mm, 100% couldn't agree more. So we have a, a question that has been has gotten a lot of upvotes, actually. Uh, writing feels like a huge intellectual and emotional investment. At what point do you abandon projects? It's Drew's question. I'm like, Whew. okay. <laughs> oh, you know, there's a, there's not a specific like metric. You know, I'm I'm only thirty percent of the way into this project, and I realize I have no plot, just a lot of pretty people running around. Um, as someone who has written multiple projects and and abandoned them, um, many before I and 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 I say that like of the ones that I wrote to completion. When I say 12 books, I mean, I, I actually literally wrote like 12 complete books, right? Um, I think I only shopped out about six of them um, in terms of trying to find an agent. Uh, and then before that, I, you know, and you, you're probably the same way, there's, I think, 80 million ideas that never get any further than like this little spark yep. or three sentences scribbled onto the back of a napkin somewhere. Um, so it, to, to answer Drew's question, it, like, yeah, it is a, it is a huge intellectual and emotional investment. Um, and the abandoned set point um, is I think different for everybody. Um, I, I abandoned, the space opera that I mentioned earlier, the book that I wrote, I actually, I wrote three books. <laughs> I wrote three books in this series, um, like three complete books 
um, was shopping the first one out, did not like got a couple of hits, got a couple of requests, um, got a couple of really lovely rejections, which are somehow the most painful of all things. Um, and it just didn't seem like there was a market for it. Um, and so I like decided this is the point where we put it away. And um, it was hard because I really love that book. I love the story. I loved all the characters. Um, and it's the only one of all the ones that I could, like, could, maybe, <laughs> um, that I could maybe resurrect and, and clean up enough to sell. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm continually of the opinion that there are no such thing as wasted words and that all of the work that you do, even if you end up having to abandon it, has taught you something, has given you something of value, and is therefore like worthy work to have done. I'm going to do something I swore I'd never do and quote Kanye West, um, because he, he, he could write back in the day and he said, everything I did made me everything I am. Um, so yeah, 100% agree with you. Even if something doesn't turn out the way you want, it's still improved you as a writer it still built your skill um i mean from from my perspective i i'm lucky in that i have very very few trunk novels my first novel i wrote was the first novel that got published and that's not me bigging myself up necessarily because i had 10 years of journalism before that where i ironed out all the shitty writing and learned how to tell a reasonably decent story so there are a lot of editors sending stuff back to me and going this article is crap fix it um but i do have i think one book that I got to 70% of the way through and just went, this is not working. And that wasn't so much an emotional investment. It was because it was a particularly thorny project that dealt with antimatter and quantum physics. And I got 70% of the way in and went, I don't know the science well enough. I have tried. God help me. I have tried to wrap my brain around quantum physics and antimatter. And I just don't know enough to write this book the way I wanted to. So I had to put it aside and it crushed me because I fucking loved it. It was about anti-gravity and hover cars and hoverboards and ultimate dimensions. And it just didn't work. The damn thing right. just didn't work. Well, go back to school and learn it and then finish writing it. Because I'll go now back I to want school to and learn, learn quantum physics. Yeah, yes. sure. No, I, So you can write me a book. <laughs> so I can write you a book. God, antimatter. You think time travel is complicated. Antimatter is just... <sighs> anyway, yeah. So I haven't had to do that a lot. It crushed me when it happened. Um, it's horrible having to abandon a project, but um, Katie, as you say, it all, all the words matter. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just like, for those of you, if you're looking for like, where do you, where do you kind of stop and, and reassess? I, like I said, it's, it's really kind of individual and you just, you need to ask yourself, like how much more effort do I want to put into this? Do I feel like it's worth continuing to work on? Or are there some very specific problems here? You know, is this not my story to tell? Is this um, something that I don't understand well enough scientifically to be able to accurately tell it? Um, you know, do I think that it's not working and I need to go back and revise and, you know, tear it completely apart and start over? Um, all of those questions, I think, are are valid questions to ask yourself, and then that it's like tell yourself that it's okay, and and you can write something else. You got to be kind to yourself as a writer, otherwise you'll just die. Yeah, yeah. We've got less than ten minutes left. Should we try to tackle a couple more questions, like quick fire? I feel like we can. Yeah, we've been so. doing well. Thank you for all the questions, by the way, guys. Everybody. You guys doing so well. It's brilliant. Did you pick? Is it my turn? Yeah, go go ahead. Pick one. My, oh, what did we just, uh, let's see. Um, where do you find the balance slash draw the line when it comes to writing a character whose identification is different from your own? And that's from Mustafa. Um, huh. Where do you find the balance or draw the line when it comes to writing a character whose identification is different from your own? Um, I, I, I'm... I'm not quite sure I fully understand this question. Um, is identification is different from your own? Are we talking in terms of uh, race or gender or sexual identity? Um, I'm not sure I understand this one. That that's my assumption that it's like that it. Okay. Yeah. Let's that go with that. 
You're writing a, you're, I'm assuming again, since I haven't read your book, which <laughs> um, <laughs> for anybody who's keeping track, that's twice that I mentioned that I have not read. <laughs> I read Rob's books. I like Rob better. Oh, uh, yeah, I like Rob better too. Jackson's a jackass. Anyway, <laughs> you know, okay, I, no, serious, it's a serious question. Let's, let's try to deal with this. <laughs> right. Um, that Tegan, Tegan identifies as, as female would be my yes. guess. Um, so yeah, like where, um, how, like, how did you feel writing her? What, what did you, you know, ask your wife questions? Did you <laughs> reach out to, to people who are cis or trans women and ask them what it feels like to be a woman in order to better write her? Um, I didn't, um, perhaps I should have, I look at it. I think I can split this question into two separate elements, you know, if I'm writing a character whose identification is different from my own and their identification is not central to the plot, as, as for example, Tegan being a woman is not central to the plot of the girl who could move shit with her mind. I mean, the, the plot would not change if she was a man. It would just be the boy who could move shit with his mind. Um, I think my role is to write them as, be as believably as possible, to make them as interesting and balanced a character as possible. If their identity has a bearing on the plot or if it has a bearing on their own personal journey, uh, so for example, if the character is gay or trans or any of the permutations, then I think it behooves me to speak to as many people as possible about it, to get as full a perspective as I can. I Hands up, I don't do this enough. Um, I have done it in the past, but definitely not nearly enough. And it's something that I, and I think a lot of other authors as well, need to get better at, particularly when it comes to the representation of characters who are not cisgendered. Because um, you don't want to cock this up. It's not fair to these to, 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 to people who have that identity to get this wrong, especially given how they've been represented in the past. So long-winded answer is it's extremely complicated. It's very hard to find a balance, uh, but we need to keep working at it and do a better job of it. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's a great answer. And I, I agree with you that it is, it is infinitely something that needs to be done with care and with a kind of great deal of thought and that writers uh, particularly those who choose to write about marginalized groups need to make sure that they are doing so with respect and with um, with also the understanding that you are probably going to fuck something up because you Damn straight. can't understand. You can't understand what it's like to be somebody that you're not. Um, so yeah, I would I would fully agree with you. Um, and I, as always, um, like asking people not for permission, but asking people for resources and doing your own research and being willing to pay people for the time that they spend, you know, if they are willing to educate you is, is also super duper important. Could not agree more. Um, with the with the new book, I Have the Shitstorm that's coming out next year and I'm working on now, this is something I ran into head first because that book deals with, specifically deals with racial issues. And I wrote it before the current um, Black Lives Matter protests kicked off. And what those protests made me think of is, well, if I'm tackling racial issues in this book, I need to make sure that I'm getting this right. I need to make sure that I am doing my due diligence. And my first thought, and this does not paint me in a good light, my first thought was, well, I have several black friends. I can ask them to read it and I can ask them to give me feedback. And I thought, no, wait a second. It's not their job to educate me. It's not their job to tell me if I'm right or wrong. If I want someone to do that, I can bloody well pay them some money to do that. So we're going with a sensitivity reader. So yeah, it's uh, it's something that everybody has to tackle, I think, sooner or later. Certainly um, straight white males have to tackle sooner or later, or we fucking better tackle it. Uh, yeah, but as you say, you're gonna fuck up. You are absolutely gonna fuck up and you have to be okay with the fact that you're gonna fuck up and be ready to apologize for it and do better. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, We've got like two two minutes left. Do we have time for like one more qu quick quick fire like, question? Tattoos. <laughs> tattoos. Okay, you first. Go show tattoos. I'm like, oh dear God, how many do I have? Um, okay, we're, pick, pick pick the good ones. Like, I mean, they're all, all good. You know what I mean? Right. We're at like thirty now. Um, I have a a whole host. There's a lot of writing. Um, 
this is this is actually my what I call my writing arm. This is one of the first tattoos that I got, and it's from one of the first series uh, of books that I wrote, um, which was about a, a young woman who runs away from home to become the first female knight of Ooh. the Order of the White Rose. Um, and uh, oh, we were talking all about the uh, um, the Star of Andrana, and I did not. Yes. Yeah, you've got a tattoo of that, don't you? I have it on my arm. You've got your own um, tattoo. And then there we have Pluto. Um, yep. and I think it's, I don't know if it's showing up non-reverse to you folks. It looks reverse to me. Um, don't panic. No, we got it. It says don't panic in large friendly letters, also known as oh, my good. father's handwriting. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. And then there are there are numerous more. We're not going to get up and do a whole show. So, but, hmm. and it's. You go, because... <laughs> okay. All right, quickly. So I, a lot of the tattoos are under my shirt. I'm not going to take my shirt off. The light would dazzle you. But I will show you the sleeve. So this is my African white-faced Scopsal. Um, he's my dude. I love him. Uh, and what I did was I have I have very prominent veins on my arm. I always have. And I they're probably the body feature I hate the most. So I decided a while back that what I wanted to do, and I hope I tilt it down, is I wanted to get... Uh, jasmine, jasmine flowers and jasmine creeper that goes along the veins. So I turned a bit of my body that I didn't like into something that I really do like. Um, oh. And I have a couple more, but as I said, they're all like here yeah, and we're pretty much out of time anyway. So yeah, that's what you get to see. Tune in next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, before we sign off, tell folks where they can find you on the internet since I'm okay. assuming you don't want people showing up at your door. Yes, right. No, please don't do that. Uh, right, so you can find me at, at Real Jackson Ford. That's Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. It's one, one word, Real Jackson Ford. And I'm also at jacksonfordauthor.com. Awesome. And, and you? Uh, you can find me um, on Twitter for the most part. Uh, it's at KB Wagers. Um, I am rarely on Facebook, but there is a fan page on Facebook. If you go to my main author page, which I think is just the author, KB Wagers, um, there's a link somewhere for the fan page. And if you like plants and cats um, and other lovely things, I am on Instagram at Midway Brawler, which is my Pacific Rim Jaeger name. So. <laughs> I always wondered about that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's a good Jaeger name, actually. I, you know what? I keep thinking about changing it for the brand, and then I'm no, like, no, I'm no, 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 good. I'm doing an Adam Savage thing, and I'm going to stick <laughs> with, with my name there and because I, I do it. Like it. So, oh, thanks so much for joining yes. us. Yes. Thank for you, all guys. Great questions. We appreciate it. Terrific questions. We planned a whole bunch of questions in case there weren't enough, and you guys just bowled us over with the not just the number of questions, but the quality of questions. This has been so much fun. Yeah. So, and you can, you can buy our books. Yes. Yeah. Buy the books. Big green button at the bottom. Yeah. Buy Jackson and Katie's books. Greatest button ever. Keep us in cat and dog food. It's awesome. Exactly. <laughs> All righty. Thank okay. you so much, guys. Thanks. It's been a great chat.